Hello and welcome back to The Trading Floor, the Friday show where I'm joined by co-founder Piers Curran and we talk all things global markets. And this week on the agenda, we've got three topics we're going to go through. Now a US debt ceiling deal has been struck. What comes next is the big question. And there are far-reaching implications, as Piers will explain. And then secondly, stocks still going up. Seems like we're on a bit of a rinse-repeat cycle at the moment. Keep hearing all the bearish commentary and we just keep going up and right now the s and is just clocking in its highs as we speak now trading at 42 45 when it wasn't that long ago people were talking about the 4200 level being pretty big from a technical perspective we are well above that at the moment so we want to talk a little bit more about this concept and idea of the narrowness of the equity rally there's been a lot of commentary on that in various financial media and we want to explain what exactly that means and what does it indicate for the future for the equity direction in the short term. We definitely can go back and punch the numbers. So the third thing, Apple's next big product, the Reality Pro headset, was expected to be announced at the Apple Developer Conference on Monday. And we'll have a bit of a discussion about what to expect there and, and implications really for, it seems like the VR thing has gone a bit quiet, it kind of like it broke out. It was like the hot topic momentarily. I guess this was pre the kind of meta euphoria um, in terms of metaverse, not meta the company. And it's sort of taken a back seat, a few full starts, it seems, on the virtual reality front. So it'd be interesting to see whether they can deliver a lot of excitement around that event. Um, but yeah, let's kick it off then, Piers. I know we just spoke about the, the order of play here. I wanted to put stocks up first and talk about the narrowness, but you said, look, I can make treasury bills sexy. <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of regretting committing <laughs> to that task, but I'm going to give it a go. Okay. Let's do it. Okay, well, look, let me just get everyone up to speed then. So the Senate late Thursday, so that being the 1st of June, passed the House to approve bill to raise the debt ceiling and cap government spending for two years. And the next process there is kind of a foregone conclusion. The legislation lands on the desk of President Joe Biden. He signs it, essentially. So he's expected to do that today, which is the 2nd of June. He'll then, of course, address the nation and talk up the deal. Um, and it comes just three days before the US risked its uh, potential then cliff edge scenario. So we've averted a lot of the discussion we've been talking about the last couple of weeks. But I guess the bigger question now, Piers, is, well, what next? Yeah, let's definitely talk about what next. I, I, you know what's going to happen. Biden's going to stroll out, having signed his bit of paper. He's going to stroll out into the Rose Garden and start claiming that politics is the winner and that we've avoided the biggest economic disaster in the history of mankind and uh, whatever. Just, just really dull. You, 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 there's one thing you just, you've made a, uh, an assumption there. Go on. He said he's going to stroll out. I saw a video <laughs> where he fell over yeah. yesterday. <laughs> right. He's going to be wheeled out, <laughs> um, I should have said. Um, just really dull. Yeah, I mean, we said it on the podcast last week. We were, you know, selfishly, you know, hoping for a little bit of mm. drama, you know, a bit of uh, government shutdown action. Um, so, yeah, it's all been a bit bit boring. Uh, so let's just put that behind us. What's next? So what you've got to understand is the actual borrowing limit, okay, the debt ceiling, which defines the borrowing limit, they actually hit it in January. Okay. So you might ask, well, what's been going on since January through to June then? And they've been paying for stuff um, using what they term extraordinary measures. Now, there are two words that, that carry no detail whatsoever. I don't know where they get the cash from uh, to cover the bills for the last five months, but that is the fact, right? The borrowing limit was hit in January. Ever since then, they've been muddling through, I don't know, cash down behind the sofa. God knows where they get the money from, but um, it all seems a bit odd. But it's quite an important point because now the debt ceiling bill is passed, then it means, right, the government can start borrowing more again, 
right? But they've got to make up for five months of no borrowing first to kind of refill those extraordinary measure coffers to reload the back of the sofa, right? So they've got to make up for the five months that they've missed. Then they've got to start borrowing for the remainder of the year, right? And basically all this winds up to what analysts are expecting is that in the next four months that you're going to see a massive spike in treasury issuance. It just means there's going to be a huge deluge of new bonds being issued by the government so that then they can borrow money and fill, refill the coffers. They reckon it's going to be $750 billion worth of issuance in the next four months. Then borrowing, obviously, through to the end of the year, they reckon actually by the end of the year, so in the next seven months, we'll see $1.1 trillion come to market. Okay. Um, now, what does that mean? I mean, obviously, that's a huge sum of money. Just putting to, to one side, I don't want to really talk about, is it right that they borrow more? Is it right the debt ceiling goes up? Is it right their debt clock continues to spiral out of control? Let's park that. What's it going to mean for markets in the next seven months? And there are, yeah, there are some hazards ahead, I would say. Um, so what happens here? If they issue $1.1 trillion worth of bonds, well, well, number one, someone's got to buy them. Now, this is normally, it's the primary dealers. So these are the biggest banks. They've got the big balance sheets. They've got the sufficient amount of liquidity and cash to operate in this environment. Because if a government wants to sell $1.1 trillion worth of assets, you're going to need some pretty big buyers. So the 15 biggest banks are the only ones who can operate in the primary market. That's when the bonds are being issued and sold for the first time. The banks buy them, then the banks kind of just farm them out to their clients. They, you know, so They'll, they'll sell these on to their clients, not only financial institution clients like hedge funds and asset management firms and all the rest of it, but also then maybe in their wealth management division, they'll start parking some of this stuff in their high net worth, you know, client uh, portfolios and so on, right? So these big banks operate as a bit of a conduit for all this issuance. But the point remains, they need $1.1 trillion worth of cash. So where are they going to get the cash? from. We're not quite sure, to be honest. They're going to probably have to sell other stuff, okay? Um, now, might maybe stocks. Some people are worried that perhaps this is a negative for the equity space because people are going to have to sell their stocks in order to raise cash to then buy, their, buy these new bonds, right? But I think that aside, I think the most important thing here is the liquidity conditions in the market will drop. This is sucking 1.1 trillion dollars worth of cash out of the market okay and with that then comes secondary and tertiary impacts um firstly with banks right if they're having to use a lot of their liquid reserves to buy up these bonds that means there's less liquid reserves which might alter their appetite for lending money so it may be it might curb lending out into the system and just as we're worried that Maybe we're inching towards the recession that never seems to want to start. Um, well, this is further tightening conditions that might kind of, you know, just grease the wheels to that recession actually beginning. I think more importantly, though, you've got to think about a supply issue here. So just very simple economics. If the supply of something goes up, well, then the price goes down. OK, so you're going to get a big spike in supply which is likely going to drive treasury prices down. Now, what happens if treasury prices go down? Well, the yields on these bonds go up. And the problem with that is treasury yields are one of the world's you know, go-to benchmarks for setting borrowing costs you know, across the entire system. So if treasury yields rise, borrowing costs rise. It's like a pseudo rate hike. Again, that's a tightening condition on an economy we're worried is already losing momentum. Um, so I think that's probably the biggest issue 
um, the biggest risk. Now, what can be done about that? Because obviously you might think, well, okay, what do the Fed do? Because I mean, the Fed, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of still in the balance. Are they going to hike? Are they not in June? We're not quite sure, but if they're worried about tightening conditions as a knock-on effect from this massive issuance of treasuries, they might not be able to hike. But then something else that's happening at the Fed that people have forgotten about is this thing called quantitative tightening. So back in the pandemic, uh, the central bank stepped in and rolled out a massive quantitative easing program. This was a stimulative policy where they um, effectively increase the money supply, okay? Well, they've been trying to reverse that um, over the last few months. And really, you've got to go back, and I say months, you've got to go back 12 months, really, I would say. So for the last 12, maybe 14 months, the Fed have been reducing their balance sheet. So that means they are sucking cash out of the system. They're reducing the money supply by not reinvesting the cash that they get from maturing assets, okay? So they're basically reducing the money supply to try and reverse all of that stimulus from the COVID. A lot of that stimulus, of course, is being blamed for the inflation crisis that we have today. There was one little blip in the uh, quantitative tightening trend, and that was the SVB banking crisis, which saw them actually increase the money supply again um, quite sharply, but we've, we've been back on the downward trajectory for money supply, you know, for the last sort of month or so. So this might lead to the Fed. You know, I would say it could be that this Treasury issuance could have the biggest influence on Fed policy than anything else out there. Forget about inflation, you know, forget about whatever, the jobs market, forget about a looming recession. It actually could well be this factor alone that is the biggest influence on the Fed. And that's because the Fed might think it will have the biggest influence on the timing of when the recession might start. No, this is a, it's a robust theory. Yeah. Go and on. I can tell you're pretty hyped for this. Let's go. But if, so, why is the S&P still rallying then? <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. Uh, yeah. So your thesis, well, your thesis, like I, I, I agree with, um, yeah. on every point. Well, I'll tell you what, markets why. is about timing, but at the moment, it, so at, well, as a trader, how do you then? So you have this view, let's say, that's well constructed, but yeah. the market is moving um, against that view at the moment. So right. how do you, how do you how so do you play you, that? So you either play it by basically the market's telling you you're wrong. The thesis is invalid. Uh, well, I, firstly, yeah, you've got to go, okay, well, that's a thesis, right? Obviously, the market, stock market's not behaving in line with that thesis. So what are the other factors that are, that are at play? And then we've got one in a minute. Well, we'll this rolls nicely into the tech stock. Oh, yeah, I, see what you, I see what you've done here. <laughs> yeah. Um, but before we delve into that, I think it's quite important from a sort of bias point of view. There's this thing called confirmation bias, which is dangerous. This is where you have an opinion and you are so bought into that opinion that you, um, at best, discount information that is contrary to that opinion. At worst, you entirely ignore it. And so you're just left with this idea that nothing in the world can persuade you is wrong. And then you plow on stubbornly with this thesis. And, and in the end, it can be really expensive if you're wrong. I mean, obviously, your thesis is right, then fine, happy days. But you know, there can be scenarios. So you've got to be, I'd say, to, to avoid confirmation bias, you've got to really start to you know, mentally go through an exercise, which might be, right, I'm going to take the exact opposite opinion this is a thought experiment, right? I'm going to take the exact opposite opinion and can I back it? Can I come up with some convincing arguments as to why the opposite opinion might be true? Yeah. Um, so I think you've got to go through, or in the real world, you might buy research hmm. from analysts that are taking up the opposite 
opinion, right? And so that would be a healthy way of getting a kind of 360 set of opinions on a situation. Then with the full 360 set, fine, you can then pick and choose, you know, which way you want to lean, right? Um, okay. That's kind of, but I'm going to, uh, having said all yeah, that, I was going to say, hit me with your confirmation bias then. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, the stock market's going up. I'm going to give you two reasons why the stock market is wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Dangerous words. Um, number one, well, the debt ceiling, it hasn't been lifted yet. Sleepy Joe's got a sign off his bit of paper today. So actually, until that's signed, the debt ceiling isn't raised. And the Treasury can't start this deluge of new issuance. Okay, so the, the bonds haven't hit, the spike in supply of bonds hasn't hit the market yet. What probability are you signing to, uh, to him not inking that piece of paper then? Zero. I mean, yeah, zero. I mean, hundred percent. He'll sign it. Yeah, I know what I know what you're saying. You're going to say markets would be pricing in that he's signing it, and they'd be pricing in already this new issuance. And well, that's I kind of a big hole. Please, in please my go theory. for your second point, though. You had a second point. <laughs> yeah, I, just <laughs> just pipe down. Um, that's point number one, which is very weak. Point number two, which is a stronger point. Hmm. Yeah, why is the stock market rallying? And we mentioned this, I think, last week or maybe it was the week before briefly, and I thought we'd just dig into it in a little bit more detail. Um, this rally, talking of like the S&P 500, is incredibly narrow. Um, you've got 500 stocks in that index, but actually the, the vast majority of the rally is just based off six. Six of the 500 are responsible for the vast majority of the rally. The six being the big six. I mean, it used to be the big five, but we've now got, we've got a new big dog in town. So the original big five, Apple, Amazon, Google, Meta, Microsoft have been joined, of course, by NVIDIA, who have now launched and briefly did break the $1 trillion club this week. I think, uh, I think, did they tick back down? Anyway. Well, they did tick back down, but they could well be ticking back up now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you've got these big six, right, that are leading the charge. And it's kind of crazy if you kind of took the big six. Like you're talking about the S&P 500 index right now, it's trading up at levels we haven't seen since August last year, okay? Um, but if you took the big six out, then we're trading well below the levels. In fact, we're trading, you've got to go back to 2021 to find the last time we were here, right? So without the big six, the index is down on the year. 2023, the index is down on the year, even though with the big six, I'm not sure what the stats are, but it's definitely up on the year, right? So it's very narrow. Now, what, what does that mean? Is that a problem? I mean, historically, a lot of analysts would point to the fact that if there's only a few little stocks that, or well, not little, so it's the, right, the exact wrong word, a few large stocks that are, um, it, the rally's dependent on just a few large stocks. It means that it's not sustainable. Um, and therefore, there's a risk, and it's normally a signal that maybe the top of the rally or the momentum of the rally is running out. Now, you'd look at the market now, though, and go, well, this has been the story for the whole year. So, and it looks like the, the momentum's not running out. And look, the AI revolution has been an anomaly in this particular narrow rally. I think so. This narrow rally is different to others. Um, it's not, you know, because you've got this, what is potentially the beginning of a long term secular kind of new trend, right? But ignore that point because that's not helping my thesis. Um, <laughs> so there's there were a couple of analysts who've done some digging on this and um, got some technicals out. So there's a guy called Adam Turnquist, uh, who is an analyst at LPL Financial. But he was looking at historically stock market rallies and narrow rallies. And he he's using... He's using, he's basically looking at how many companies in the index are trading above their 200 day moving average versus how many are trading below their 200 day moving average. Okay. And he's tracked back on the SP 500 back to 1991. And he's broken 
the fa- the periods up into quintiles, right? So five segments, and we're right now in the most extreme fifth quintile, which means you've got less than half of the stocks in the index trading above their 200-day moving average. This is then the extreme scenario where it's a narrow rally. His analysis says that on average, for the next 12 months looking forward, once you've got into the fifth quintile, on average, the market drops 1.9% in the first month. It drops 5.5% in the first three months. It drops 8% in six months. And then over a 12 month period on average, it's down 6.8%. So his thesis based on the 200 day moving average analysis is that you almost certainly get downside in the index over the next 12 months. That's his thesis. I will counter it. I'm playing my confirmation bias technique here. There's another guy called Brian Belsky. He works for BMO. He's looked at this differently. Um, and he's looking at stock out before. He's, he's saying, right, what happens to the stock market if the top five stocks have reached a peak relative performance? That's when the top five have rallied more than one standard deviation above the average, which is definitely the case we're in right now. So he's used a slightly different way of looking at narrowness. And actually, his analysis shows that over the next six to 12 months, Actually, the stock index performs as normal. You wouldn't say that now there's a higher probability of it going down or up. Um, so he kind of counters that analysis. Um, but look, this is all the technical, so you can spin any argument you're on, you want. I mean, why are tech stocks rallying and will they continue to rally is, I guess, the crux of it. And I think that I've already mentioned one reason the beginning of this secular long-term AI boom just so happens to have happened in this kind of narrow stock market rally. And you could say that's currently, and I think it's probably incorrect, but right now in the short term, analysts think that it's the big tech players that are going to be the basically the only beneficiaries from the AI boom, which, which is obviously nonsense. But there's a stronger argument, and that is in times of uncertainty, We've got a new safe haven. So this was going to be my point, as you're explaining. Take it, was, take it away. Well, it was that. So I, I've I've followed L, LPL Financial Research for quite a while, and they hmm. they do put out some really great um, backward looking historical data sets. Um, but as you said, they're like absolute like perfect fodder for confirmation bias because you can yeah. basically look at a single scenario and back test that. But as you are kind of going through that, and as much as that makes sense, um, I'd like to see what does that same time period look like when it's post debt ceiling agreement or in this moment of the Fed cycle, or there's like, it's a, it's a multi-layered thing when you're trying to back test yeah. it rather than a singular, because then it can be a bit dangerous, I think. And particularly because media gets hold of it, I'm assuming you read this in the FT or Bloomberg, and then it's like citing something that feeds a narrative, which is always quite quite dangerous. But the point you were saying at the end, I mean, you pretty much just summed it up. I find it hard when I think backward looking, the tech stocks are different now. Yeah, it's true. The The size of them, the diversification of their business, the ownership of their business. I mean, they the the corporate bonds that are out there now that weren't there before. The, just on every level, I think that, as you said, I think big tech, it goes up when rates are low and it goes up through that pandemic period. It goes up when people are uncertain because yeah. it's just a safe place to park your money at this point. Well, They've kind of gone above, they're at the summit now. And it's, yeah. It's like, yeah, you, you say that. So tech stocks go up when rates are low, definitely. Right. And that's that. This is what we call the long duration trade. And that's about mm. the, you know, discounted cash flows and, you know, future earnings become more uh, worth more today when rates are low. Right. And we get that. But tech stocks have also gone up when rates are high. <laughs> so, which, and so that then comes back to, I think, big tech goes up when rates are high. 
Right, I should clarify. Yeah. And this is about massive, you know, strong free cash flow. I mean, it's, mm. yeah, monopolies, right? The, the barriers to entry to compete, it's just literally unreachable. And, you know, obviously all their products have a key central place in the modern economy and they're just all powerful. And I think that's the best argument to explain what's happening here in 2023. Now, will that continue, though, is the big question. And yes, the AI, AI stories come in just to give it a little bit more of a boost. But I still think whilst this tech rally, I definitely didn't predict at all. And I'm kind of staggered by it, to be honest. But um, I still think there are, on balance, more negative factors on the horizon than positive. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, when the stock market goes up pretty consistently, I mean, <laughs> that's the general <laughs> conclusion, right? But then, yeah. The so, thing. okay. So, look, the, talking of tech, let's then yeah, mo- transition into Apple. Um, and I was just thinking, you know, we're talking, I, I, it's almost like we were on the conference calls and it was like, how many times can we say AI on the podcast? I think we've managed <laughs> about 20 so far. <laughs> AI. Um, AI. So, um, yeah, Apple, it almost feels like, even though we're going to talk about the Reality Pro, the VR headset, <sighs> reality headsets are a bit boring, though, like a bit mistimed, it feels. Right. This, this narrative of um, virtual reality, um, I actually remember it back in the mid 90s, Piers Brosnan. <laughs> and the lawnmower man if any if anyone's oh, old wow. enough to remember that wow that was like, when that's i'm pretty sure that was that's uh, even before my time <laughs> <laughs> this was when pierce brosnan the former was that bond pierce brosnan? yeah i think Wasn't it was that yeah. like arnie no no, 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 no you're thinking that... of um a different a futuristic one that was the running man ah uh, the running I'm talking man, about yeah. the lawnmower man okay sorry sorry come on yeah anyhow so we had this kind of like, I think that was when it was like complete infancy of like technology. It was like this um, kind of conceptual idea of virtual reality. And it turned out to be this like horror show, basically. Yeah. As it does in the early phase. Um, and then we had the kind of a few years back, pre-metaverse, big talk about virtual reality. And it was like AR, VR. Everything was AR, VR. How many times can you say in your conference call to juice your stock price? <laughs> then it pivoted to metaverse. Crypto kind of like littered in. Yeah. And now we've arrived at AI. So it's a bit slow, no? I mean, to get actual, like, I think immediate bang for your buck, I think is going to be, just to say right now, very limited on this. Yeah. Because they're just not hitting the right spots of what, um, I guess, the broader investor community is really latching onto at the moment and i was just looking at bank of america citing this kind of quote baby bubble in ai and tech funds attracting an all-time high of 8.5 billion dollars in the week through to the 31st of may which is like huge but they're certainly not that's not in anticipation of the reality pro headset i don't think um so yeah, that, that just just a point on timing there. But I thought what we could do is just talk a little bit less about the technology, yeah, uh, and more about I guess the the business case for this type of product. Um, so a couple things, and I'll run through. So enhanced communication. I think one of the things that we have had is that behavior has changed somewhat, and although we're getting more return to work in person situation as things have, have normalized, there is still now a, uh, a a belief that there is some idea behind being able to still be productive and have flexibility in your workforce to a certain degree. Sectors dependent in that way. So that being said, then, how do you optimize that experience of being able to participate in virtual meetings, view shared content, collaborate in projects in real time? And yeah, that could be well uh, constructed within that environment. Is, yeah. is what some would say then improved customer experiences and i think this i think actually think this is a really big area if not one of the biggest and this is the ability to provide real-time information virtual overlays 
and immersive experiences. So think particularly retail. So shopping. I mean, I was only on the Adidas website the other day looking at a new pair of trainers. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to try these on. <laughs> I just sat, sat there on my sofa and like uh, zap some AR sneakers on my feet and had a little walk around, pivot your what, foot So around. what, using your phone? Using your phone. Well, so yeah, you I thought that your was phone quite... camera at your feet and it yeah. lays on. But it, but it moves with your foot. It's just augmented. And right. um, I thought, okay. So if you think about that, for that customer experience yeah so if I, you're shopping yeah, I get that for sure <clears throat> yeah and then increased productivity so this was more focused on areas like manufacturing construction healthcare the idea here productivity being providing workers with real-time information virtual assistance so think of if i'm a car mechanic and i'm working on an engine and i'm not quite sure how to tackle this particular issue i can virtually augment then a secondary visual which then can go into and explain a product in a kind of real-time instruction manual sense yeah and can it's make like the matrix or kind of yeah teach so me can, how to fly that helicopter it's kind of like just taking, download it yeah, yeah taking youtube but making it much more uh, you know I, i've done that before when my my pram's broken and you're like right. watching youtube and you're like ah what did you do? And you go back again and again. And you're like, I can't see the nut that you're turning. What is that? Like, so yeah, that alone, I would buy one of these things <laughs> to avoid that watching YouTube for the same five seconds about a hundred times. Um, so that's one thing. Yep. Then there's new business models. So this whole kind of immersive experience, this talking more about uh, entertainment venues, um so think about they've already really started to do some of this type of thing but you know boxing basketball football these types of things unlocking then a global audience outside of your uh, physical stadiums things of that yeah. nature but then you know you could talk about museums historical sites uh then that starts to move into education as well could you improve that optimize that experience for learning languages, cultural differences, things like that, at informative stages. I, I, I do say that, that schools are funded by the government, so there's no way they're buying one of these puppies <laughs> at $3,000 a pop. But the idea, right. let's say. Then there's um, better data visualization. So this idea of making data more engaging, intuitive, interactive, um, meaning that finance, logistics, operations, you know, can by having things like 3D models overlays just help make more informed decisions. And then supply chain, logistics sector, could there be a quicker, more accurate infantry management system, warehouse workers visually queuing things, feeding back into the data centers rather than just actual then movement of goods, passage of goods. So this All was right. like quite a good article that I saw, and it was kind of like that's talking about not Apple, but yeah, just right. the, the the business um, kind of case for these types of of products. So yeah, any any thoughts on any of those Can yet? I, well, I mean, yeah, all that sounds great, <laughs> but there's a big but here in Apple's product. Mm. Two, there's two big buts. And they don't lie. Um, Three thousand dollars is the yeah. first one. That is the price. I mean, come on, three thousand bucks. I mean, I know they've been working on this thing for years. Um, you know, trying to perfect it. And has it taken them too long? Because actually, now you've missed the boat. Because that that ship sailed and has and sank. And the AI juggernauts just coming through over the top. That's, that's one argument. But my biggest point, certainly in the short term, two words, headset. So Apple's mixed reality headset. Mm. That's where it's not going to work in the short term. No one wants to wear a headset. We've seen it. Facebook have already tried it. Yeah, I've got, I mean, I've, I've literally got one on my shelf. I bought it. What was it there? Um, Oculus. I can't remember the name of it now. 
Anyway, Oculus, vi- quest. Oculus quest, isn't it? I think they're, so I bought one, I think it was like a lot of money, but three, 300 quid or something like that, not 3000. So I bought one. It was great for like six months. And then it's been on the shelf for the last two years. No one's ever used it. So I think right now the technology isn't good enough. People aren't going to wear this massive headset on their face and walk around in society. So until the technology gets so good where it can be embedded in your glasses or even, I mean, I guess eventually in your contact lens, when it gets that good, fine, there'll be potentially mass adoption Mm. right across the planet but i think in the meantime a big chunky headset on your face is ultimately get plus the price is going to be a barrier like for example meta's quest 2 their new latest version that only costs 299 dollars and you know how many vr headsets got sold last year eight and a half million which isn't very many so the market for big chunky headsets, even at three hundred dollars, isn't there? Never mind ten times the price. Okay, so I get that, and I think you're absolutely right. I mean, if you think about putting on a physical headpiece, which restricts your actual viewing, unless you have an ability to transition from the virtual screening to actual like glasses view so that you can move with this thing on, but then it's, it's a physical impediment having that on. Yeah. Um, however, you just mentioned the Oculus and Facebook is not cool. Facebook has the worst brand <laughs> and face having anything to do with Facebook um, has no prestige. It has no premium value. And we know that young people specifically, and also certain geographic locations of new affluency, i.e. China, uh, can't get enough of uh, showing their ability to purchase and consume these products, regardless of um, their actual use application. So yeah, yeah, it's interesting. And you, you talk price point. I mean, I was just having a quick think about this because most people that I know will own a Apple product. And I was thinking about it, like, but do they own a Apple product or do they own a few Apple products? And I was just having a look. I was like, okay, how much are the ear, the earbuds, the pro version now? And they're like 300 yeah. bucks. Yeah. And I was like, well, what about, you see a few people with the actual headphones, full on headphones, and they're like 800 bucks. Ooh. And I was like, what's an Apple Mac Pro nowadays? Okay, so that's 2000 going up, depending on what model you get. The iPhone, talking dollar wise, is knocking fifteen hundred bucks. Yeah. Then you've got. Um, I'm not even going to go into the uh, iPad. I don't think do people even use no. iPads anymore. I don't think so. So let's leave that off the list. Apple Watch. Yeah. So I, I, I guess the most common being people have the watch, have the phone, have the buds. Yeah. But we're talking about a couple of thousand dollars there. Plus, yeah. then you've got additional cloud storage that you normally have for now high res photos, which is another five to 10 bucks per month. Plus, then Apple TV, you get it for free with your mobile contract. Oh, I'll keep it. That's another 10 bucks a month. I get your point. Look, I don't think this isn't a, well, I'm not saying that this is a, a complete disaster. It's going to bomb. And the whole Apple mixed reality thing will be a complete fail. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that they're not going to sell many of these for a long time. And I think they're okay with that. I think what they're doing here is positioning themselves in this race for the long term. Like little things like, you know, who's going to buy it? Well, okay, the diehard Apple junkies plus developers. So actually, did you know there's 34 million software developers that are registered to work on Apple's devices? So they're going to be buying this to build software so that can go into these devices. So actually, I think this product will accelerate the software development cycle that will mean this software will get better quicker. But so I think this is the beginning 
these are baby steps. Mm. And I think it, you know, and as I said, can they be first to the contact lens version in, I don't know, five, 10 years time? Mm. Fine. Then it plugs into their entire suite of products that all of their customers are going to want in on. So I guess perhaps the best conclusion here is just the difference between the AI situation right now and something like the concept of a virtual reality product in the fact that AI is transformative almost immediately to yeah. tens of hundreds of millions of different people across sectors, which has an immediate impact on usage, cloud storage, chips, the supply chain, whereas with v virtual reality, there's a lot of barriers ahead. So yeah, in, it's interesting. So let's wrap it up there. That's it for this week's episode. Um, as I said, I think in the last one with Stephen, don't forget, um, there is, I think, a Q&A function now on mm. Spotify where you can leave us any questions, comments, so on. Please do, always happy to take them uh, and get your thoughts and views um on Piers's confirmation bias about shorting <laughs> stocks um, this is educational material only I must, I must must reinforce that point and also if you're listening you've made it to the end you've been enjoying the shows with, with Piers and I or Stephen please do rate and review the show on your preferred podcast platform it really helps get it out to as many people as possible to try and make hopefully finance a bit more interesting um, and also real with some real life stories uh, and then perhaps what you're studying at school. So yeah, enjoy the weekend. Thanks, Piers, and uh, catch you for next episode. See you later.